First of all, I thank you for your kind words and for the patience to read my book at some point. I really thank you for your interest. And uh, I thank you all uh, for your presence here and the School of Communication and the MTS program for uh, their kind invitation that gives me the privilege to interact with you for some time. Um, I uh, was invited to this university a little bit ago, like 40 year, 41 years ago. Um, so, uh, and this is a great university. I had not, I did not come back after that, but I always followed the excellence of the university, and particularly through in the recent years, through the collaboration between the group that, uh, uh, the research group that with uh, Peter Monji and Janet Falk, we uh, have organized at the Annenberg School of Communication, called ANN, uh, and collaboration with uh, uh, my friend Nosh Contractor uh, and Sonic, the lab that he directs. We have established a solid network of networks uh, trying to uh, cooperate in an area of inquiry we, we feel like transdisciplinary. Um, my work, of course, is never entirely in one area or in one topic or in one box. It, uh, I, I feel caged if I don't move around. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what I'm going to present today is some of the current work I'm doing um, in continuity with the work I did for quite a few years uh, and was published last year under the title of Communication Power, um, which is the, the how social movements, social change, and power relationships are transformed by the new forms of organizing communication, not just technology, but the new forms of organization of communication, which um, go into uh, the key issue of networking, because it's what I call the power of the network, ultimately. Um, but I want to take it uh, from, uh, before going into the, uh, the action, uh, I want to take it uh, from the characteristics of the internet itself and of the technology itself. Uh, so let me just start briefly by saying something about that. Uh, communication is a fundamental human activity because meaningful conscious communication is what makes humans human. So we take it from there. Um, and therefore, uh, anything that transforms the process of communication has the deepest consequences on the transformation of, of the process of social change and social organization <coughs> everywhere. Uh, this is particularly important in power relationships and in social movements and agents of social change that uh, aim at altering power relationships uh, because power throughout history in all societies has been always based fundamentally in the control of information and communication. Uh, it's what I call weak power and strong power. Weak power is the power of the guns because it lasts only as long as guns can uh, subdue minds. We'll see what's happening in the next weeks in Libya, for instance. Uh, but we have many examples in history. Of course, it may take a few days, a few years, a uh, few decades, but ultimately the power is not at the tip of the, of the gun, is at the end of the communication network. Um, and in recent years, uh, we have observed in the last two, three decades, depends how you count, formation of the new technological, communication technological paradigm in the 1970s, consolidation of this paradigm there, we have observed a, a dramatic transformation in the process of communication, which is at the same time uh, a consequence of technologies, organization, culture. The, I have tried to argue in the past that the key of this transformation is the shift of the process of transformation that relates to the entire society from what we call mass communication to what I call mass self-communication, which ultimately is from the traditional mass media to the internet and derived uh, from the internet, the web, etc. The notion is that uh, is 
in one case, we have one message from one to many with little interactivity. In other case, we have many messages from many to many uh, with interactivity in a multimodal form, and all the interactors uh, related to a hypertext of information and, and communication where they can retrieve and feed into their network with the notion that the senders are receivers and receivers are the senders. And therefore, this transforms uh, the, the communication because it's self-selected, self-retrieved, self-organized, self-directed, etc. Under the, of course, the framework of the powers in society. There are corporations, there are government, there is culture, there is all kind of things in society. But the degrees of freedom of this particular interaction are much greater than any other form of communication throughout history. Um, now, this is not an accident. Technology is material culture. Technology is not simply something that engineers design. Engineers design on the basis of ideas. Engineers do have ideas. And they have the ability to design one thing or the other and organize a system one way or another. So the way that Internet was designed was on purpose a technology of freedom, a la Ithiel de Sola Pool, although it was not, uh, he was not totally aware of the Internet at that time in 1983 when he was writing. The well, Internet, of course, started in 69. But as we know, the Internet, the people who designed the Internet and later on, uh, in Cerf, Khan, uh, John Postel, uh, uh, all the fathers of the Internet, and uh, the, the persons who later on developed the, the, the interaction of, the, of, of, of social and uh, communication interaction on the basis of the internet, uh, most notably um, Tim Berners-Lee, they all on purpose wanted the internet to be a free network of communication and to make sure of that they actually um, diffused the protocols of the internet free on the internet, uh, break, breaking through a complete uh, notion of um, uh, intellectual property rights, freedom, which, by the way, uh, history, and this is the interesting part of history, sometimes it goes well, sometimes goes badly, but the interesting <laughs> part, history uh, would have had it other ways. There's no point why the Internet should be as it is today. You know what happened? We always win thanks to the stupidity of some powerful people. <laughs> Remember, in 1970, DARPA, that had no use for the Internet, uh, because it had no military purpose. Uh, again, the, the Paul Baran story is an urban legend. Um, the, uh, actually, DARPA proposed to AT&T to take the Internet. The Internet had been deployed in 1969, so why not? AT&T looked at it seriously for six months and said, no commercial interest whatsoever. Uh, and that's how we escape. And we escaped from the French government as well that had developed Minitel, a kind of a French internet <laughs> that would literally stop at the border because to interact within the International Telecommunications Union, you needed treaties, state treaties for protocols of communication to cross the border. All right? Uh, so the, the, the internet could have been based on Minitel, based on corporate uh, intranets, and would be a completely different thing. So computer networking, yes, this is a technology and developed out of the ingenuity of engineers. But the actual construction of the Internet was the materialization of a daring culture of freedom, financed by the Pentagon, which is how wonderful uh, life can be and how much more complicated it is than either right or left think about matters. So the Pentagon didn't know what they were doing. DARPA, yes, but not the Pentagon. Um, France could not impose Minitel over a number of years, and AT&T let escape the opportunity of their lives. So we know that in recent <coughs> years, not just months, there has been a number of major challenges uh, in, in terms of social movement, which are based on this uh, technology of freedom capacity. But this, and I will come to this in a moment, but this is partly because of what is embedded in the technology. 
further technology, but also, and not only the decision of the fathers of the internet, but also the waves of technological uh, uh, cultural, the, the wave of culture that induced this technological development. In my studies on the internet, I have signaled how the internet was produced over four decades by uh, successive layers of four, uh, sorry, of six major cultures. <coughs> the, what I call the techno-meritocratic culture, meaning originally engineers and scholars uh, and students, mainly students uh, at the universities, in which simply applied the values that scholarly research has always had, meaning uh, creativity and communication of research without any particular purpose and the excellence of the research and the technology that they develop. Second, the hacker culture, uh, in the sense that Pekka Himanen has uh, and defined undocumented, meaning uh, you do something because of the passion to do this something. That's why every one of you, I think, has a hacker inside, because most of you, uh, you are able to be here at this time in the afternoon and you are not in the corporate culture, means that you decided to make less money but do something that you were passionate about. So that's what is a hacker, be it social work or teachers or technology or anything else. So uh, the hacker culture was also a culture of freedom that created many of the tools that we are doing in the internet and it started this tradition of the users being the producers of technology by interacting and organizing the hacker community. Third, the virtual communitarian culture, uh, like the well in the 1980s in the, in the Bay Area, like uh, Howard Rangel uh, in its origin. The, the communities that were built as a culture and which were trying to use the internet as a foundation for a real community in the age where people were looking for real community. Then, starting in the 1990s, the entrepreneurial culture, meaning when the internet was then freed in, in terms of uh, being privatized and being technologically diffused, the internet jumped uh, in terms uh, of the size of the um, users, of internet users. Remember the first uh, survey in the mid-1990s uh, of the internet users in the world was about 40 million. Now we are over 2 billion, uh, but the big jump, the moment in which internet reached a critical mass, um, was in the mid-1990s. Uh, and that was linked on the one hand to the ability to um, open up the internet institutionally, privatization, you could uh, actually use it uh, without paying proprietary rights, etc. And also a number of user-friendly technologies, most important of which was the World Wide Web, of course, that made the possibility of creating your own uh, web within the web. Um, but also was essential the entrepreneurial culture. The entrepreneurs, starting by the way around here, <laughs> uh, with the people who decide mosaic, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, the entrepreneurs who bet on all these technologies of freedom to buy their own freedom to be entrepreneur without going through a traditional corporate world. And that created a whole industry. <coughs> Imagine uh, all, the, all the big companies today that did not exist 30 years ago, 20 years ago, or 10 years ago. Uh, we, at one point, Apple sounds like an old corporate type, you know. Uh, uh, Google, uh, it, uh, 10 years ago, was basically nothing. Uh, they, they, they started to, to grow only uh, very lately. And in a every case, were entrepreneurs, <coughs> were people in the traditional Schumpeterian sign and, and sense of entrepreneurs. Then to this, I personally add uh, what happened in the... Uh, <coughs> in the late 1990s, and particularly in the last decade, the explosion of the mobile communication youth culture that completely transformed the uses of the internet, which I have studied one of my books, uh, and uh, which uh, literally uh, distributed networks of communication throughout the entire um, realm of life. Remember, uh, studies show that um, what is important about mobile phones and wireless communication is not portability, but permanent connectivity. This is the critical thing. Most, most, uh, most uh, calls actually are from home, work, or school. 
but it doesn't matter. Is that you are, we are always extended. The famous McLuhan augmentation uh, now has taken a, a new sense by being able to reach out or be reached out anytime, anywhere. Um, and this, by the way, is the critical moment in which uh, the internet can jump uh, throughout the, the planet because one of the reasons the internet is only 2 billion users uh, is because uh, there are no more landlines. Uh, so uh, the, the notion was that the diffusion of telephony uh, starting in 2002 was much faster and, and overtook in terms of numbers, uh, in terms of wireless connection rather than landline connection. And uh, then the internet has to migrate first slowly and then more rapidly into a mobile platform. Uh, at this point, we are, uh, we have in the planet 4.9 billion subscribers, meaning not devices, numbers of mobile phones. Okay? So, so, so much for this famous digital divide. There's plenty of digital divides in terms of the quality of the connection, in terms of the cultural capacity to use it, but not in terms of access, not in terms of access. Uh, applying a, a conservative multiplier factor, about 80% of the planet everywhere is connected at this point. And then that creates the conditions under which when the Chinese and Nokia end up uh, finish the, to develop the, the new uh, IPv6 protocol in Beijing, which they are doing, uh, the, the technological issues uh, will be improved, uh, but still not completely uh, solved, and then we then will have uh, a global, a truly global internet, which is what uh, the original thought was about. Now, all this was related, that was the technological uh, uh, development, but at the same time, there were two other trends that made the internet was a, te a technology of free communication, which is, and therefore we can see the effect in the social movements today. One was organizational change, networking. Networking has always existed since the beginning of the human history, but networking became, and this was exactly the theme of the book that you had the kindness of reading, networking became, became the, an absolute demand from society, but mainly from business. It started with business. Everything had to be networked much more efficient. Globalization was a network of networks, etc., etc. So networking came, uh, so the, the supply was the technology, but the demand came uh, from society, all right? Uh, and for the reason that I tried to explain in that book, which by the way was not at all the network society at the beginning. I, I titled the network society when I saw I was finding networks and networks and networks. So you have to be perverse uh, to keep the old title instead of the network. Um, so, and something else, something very important, culture. It's always the interaction between technology, organization, and culture. Technology, the internet, organization, networking. Culture, the culture of freedom, but more specifically, the culture uh, that uh, the culture of what I call the autonomy of the subject that emerged historically from the social movement from the 1960s and 1970s, which was extremely uh, influential precisely among the early users and designers of the internet and then extremely influential in society at large. Uh, let me stop one second in the this interaction between internet and the culture of autonomy. First, in terms of the sociological analysis, this is in fact what Giddens and Ulrich Beck have been working for a long time uh, under the notion of the culture of individuation. Individuation is not individualism, that's critical. Uh, individuation is that the center of the action in, in society is the individual in terms of the projects of the individual. Individualism is when the project of the individual is to have a great time as an individual or accumulate resources or do whatever he, she likes. 
individuation is that if I am an individual, what I am passionate about is about preserving the environment, and, and this is what I really want to do in life. I have to join with many other individuals who are like-minded and all together create a subject, a collective subject, on the basis of the freedom and autonomy of each one of the individual subjects. You see? Uh, completely different. Uh, so the opposition is not between the individualism and collectivism. No, the, the fundamental opposition is between self-constructed subjects and subjects that are not constructed as collective subjects but as strictly individual subjects, uh, the selfish, the free riders, let's say, uh, and on the other hand, uh, the notion of this communalism which is created from the top as institutions imposed on individuals. Okay? Now, but because it's so subtle, and I'm not British, I, I, <laughs> I decided that, you know, in the social movement we were calling autonomy. <laughs> Let's call it autonomy. So I, my concept is really the culture of autonomy, of being autonomous, and then autonomous vis-a-vis -vis whatever, and autonomous in terms of you, your friends, your gang, your whatever, autonomous, okay? Uh, many people have been talking about the, auton the culture of autonomy as, as a key component of the internet culture and in, pr in uh, productive interaction between the culture and the technology. But I have never seen a convincing empirical study on that. So I, I, I actually tested the hypothesis in uh, the best ba database that I know, the one I constructed, uh, in, in, in Catalonia, because I had more resources there, but also more personal interest. Uh, so in the 19th, in the, in the, between 2000 and 2007, uh, I did a mega study on uh, the internet uses in every domain of society and the entire population. In, in Catalonia, we did 55,000 interviews, of which uh, 15,000 face-to-face. Um, and one of the... Uh, uh, Key studies was a study on a representative sample of 3,000 people in, uh, in Catalonia. <coughs> These 3,000 persons uh, reflected what at the time, in 2003 when we did it, was the, the level of use of Internet. So it was a representative sample of the population at large. <coughs> and therefore there were 40% that were Internet users, 60% were not. And we compare Internet users and non-Internet users in every domain of life one and a half hours interview uh, for in face to face. So we could explore almost everything. Um, the, the whole thing is up in the web of the Open University of Catalonia. Uh, it is called Project Internet Catalonia and you have all the data there, 20,000 tables if you want in, in English if you want to, to play with that. Uh, one of the things, I, I, we did many things but this is not a presentation of the project. It's really related to the culture of autonomy. One of the things I did is to try to explore uh, the connection between internet and the culture of autonomy. So we built a series of indexes uh, of autonomy in every domain of life. Um, by autonomy understanding the capacity of the subject, the capacity of the individual in this case, uh, the attitude and the practice vis-a-vis -vis other institutions of society. For instance, in the, in the practice of uh, the individual autonomy of the, uh, the body, autonomy of the body was one of the things, uh, uh, how much people read or don't read the prescriptions, how much they look for alternative treatments, how much they try to call the doctor, how much they select uh, within the, the, the limits of the insurance, they can select one, uh, one, one doctor from another and how they relate to that, the entire medical practice of, of people in <laughs> the autonomy. So, and we put all that, uh, all that data into the machine, and I did a factor analysis. Factor analysis, I, I like it because uh, objectivates a little bit what you do. Don't like it when you simply see the factor analysis and that's it, with, with no theory. Data never speaks. You have to, to torture the data a little bit so that they can speak. Um, so we, we found uh, six factors uh, of, uh, in terms of indicators of autonomy. Professional development, autonomy in professional development, communicative autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the media, business entrepreneurship autonomy, entrepreneurship in the traditional sense, um, the body autonomy, 
autonomy of socio-political participation, and personal autonomy as affirmation of individual personality. Uh, of course, in a population, high level of autonomous people are a minority, always. In, in the case of Catalonia, it was between 18 and 23 percent, depending on the uh, type, types of autonomy. Uh, but these are critical. These are the people who move society. Okay? So, uh, statistically, the six factors, as it should be, were independent. Okay? They were different. Uh, so, not necessarily the one who was, I mean, actually not, the one who was autonomous in uh, professional development was not the same one autonomous in sociopolitical development, and so on and so on. You, you, you get the idea. And then we establish the relationship between each one of the six uh, types of autonomy and uh, uses of the Internet in terms of use or not use, frequency, intensity, and uh, knowledge. And we had time, we had two time moments. Uh, so, the results were net. Um, the more people were autonomous, the more they would score high in Internet use in every uh, indication. And the more they use Internet, the more autonomous they became. Well, it's not rocket science, but at least we, we, know, we know that there is actually a proven statistical connection, at least in the context I could study extensively, between the uses of, inter of internet and the construction of autonomy. So uh, this is, of course, critical for the analysis and the study of uh, social movements. So based on that, uh, I have been working lately on two uh, types of uses of internet in the relationship between um, social actors, and the state. The state. No, I'm not entering at this point in the corporate world, in all the powers, etc. One that I will, I will go faster, but I want to mention because I think it's important, WikiLeaks. The other, which is not WikiLeaks, and is WikiRevolutions. That, of course, have nothing to do with WikiRevolutions in my term. Uh, I, I say so that, uh, that all the, the, the criticism comes to me not to, <laughs> to anyone else, uh, which, of course, uh, are not the same thing at all. Uh, not at all, uh, as, as we'll see. Uh, WikiLeaks is actually not a wiki, and WikiRevolution is not about leaks. Um, so uh, what is interesting about WikiLeaks? I assume that you know uh, all the basic facts about, about WikiLeaks. Um, Therefore, I will not uh, use the precious time of our interaction to go over that. But if anyone is interested, I have all the documentation, so I, I can tell. Uh, you want any uh, sexy details on the matter, uh, I, I, I have all the details. Um, but the key thing about WikiLeaks is that uh, it's not WikiLeaks per se, it's the reaction against WikiLeaks. Uh, WikiLeaks was an attempt to... Um, there are many other attempts, but this one was particularly successful in providing a safe, a safe way, safe way to whistleblowers from all kinds of organizations, from the state to corporations, etc., to leak the information that they thought was depicable and that for whatever reason they wanted to uh, diffuse in the world. So th that's it. The important thing about WikiLeaks is the, the, the network they established to be able to receive information. They didn't solicit information. They didn't do any of that. They open up the possibilities with all kinds of networks, and they <coughs> actually were able to provide very good technology, cutting-edge encryption technology, to protect the Dropbox and to um, erase the traces of the communication. Uh, in, in, in most cases, the communication was through the Internet. So to do that, they uh, use and they contributed, but they mainly use a technology that is very important and, and has been used now recently in Egypt and other places, which was originally designed by a group of <coughs> Taiwanese engineers connecting also to the United States, the Onion Router. The Onion Router is simply <coughs> TOR. TOR, TOR technology is, is called. 
is simply a technology that allows to uh, erase the traces of any message being sent through the internet by going through a, a global network of volunteer computers that accept to receive and, and, and forward uh, the messages, okay, or the, the package, the package, okay? Uh, so this technology combined with encryption and combined with a global distribution of entry points uh, made possible for anyone to be able with full safety to send their information to the Dropbox. Well, full safety, talk to Bradley Manning. Um, but, but looks like it's not, not the problem with WikiLeaks, but the problem with him at the, at the source, at the origin. Uh, heroes talk too much. Um, so once the information was there, uh, WikiLeaks had a group of people, about 1,500 volunteers throughout the world, to actually check the information. And in some cases, like in the Iraq documents, went actually to Iraq and interviewed people. So they, they had an editorial, uh, they do, they have, they had and they have an editorial uh, body uh, together with an army of volunteer lawyers um, <laughs> to protect the operations of, of WikiLeaks everywhere under the protection of, um, of uh, free speech uh, wherever the, the protection exists. And of course, in other cases uh, like in China, uh, no, simply trying to hide the whole information better. Um, the, the important thing is that WikiLeaks tried to um, provide the, the safe reception and the ability to reach out to the entire world. And that's why they made an agreement with the five major newspapers in the world, uh, the Spiegel, the New York Times, Le Monde, El País, and The Guardian, to publish the uh, information edited by the media themselves. The only thing that <coughs> Sanchi uh, tried to obtain uh, was that they should refer to WikiLeaks and they should refer to the uh, website of WikiLeaks, which everybody did except the New York Times and that created a, a, a big, a big uh, fight between Assange and the New York Times. Now, it, this is not a wiki in the sense that what is wiki is the leaks. So they, it's, in that sense, it's not Wikipedia. Uh, so the, the editorial committee actually makes decisions, says this yes, this no, and it's very restrained for obvious reasons. They have to protect uh, the, the underground operation. Um, but they're legal at the same time. They're legal with different fronts in different countries. But what is wiki is leaks. Everybody can leak. You can leak. Start leaking about the school and all these things. Uh, probably do, will not be very interesting leaks and they will not be <laughs> pursued. But um, everybody can actually leak. Um, now, which one of the things that people have talked about WikiLeaks uh, a lot and they have not actually checked what they have actually leaked. And if you go through the list of, of of documents and leaks that I, I, I have collected, and but they can be collected from many sources. It's not, it's not very complicated. It's simply quite extraordinary. Uh, for instance, everybody knows about the Afghan war, about the Iraq war, but they have leaked uh, 6,500 congressional research reports that were funded by uh, the U.S. government, and. Um, NGOs, academics, and researchers had been asking for, and they never got it. We never got it. All kind of bureaucratic red tape blocks access to research funded by the government, which is our right to read. Okay, but then you start with, so in that sense, uh, it's, it's not simply the, the, the military secrets. They have... Um, For instance, one of the funniest things, it's um, the publication of 10,000 pages of a secret contract 
between the German federal government and the Toll Collect Consortium, a private operator group for heavy vehicle to tolling system that was clearly a, 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 an act of cartelization, excluding other companies from the contract for the benefit of the German government. Well, it's, it's simply a scandal. It's not, it's not that, that, that it's shaking the powers of the world. Uh, or um, the, the leak about the, in, there was a toxic leak in, in an African city in September 2009, which uh, injured thousands of people. That was originally in the, uh, published in the Independent. But then the Independent censored it and took it out from the website, and then the, the information never appeared anywhere else. Right? So, again, um, they, uh, they provided the documents about how German intelligence infiltrated Focus magazine to spy on the German journalist. They, um, of course, they um, leak the CIA report on uh, shoring up Afghan war support in Western Europe, uh, the PR strategies of the CIA in Germany and France. They uh, leak the documents of the corruption of the Kenyan president on the day of the election. They leak the corruption of the president of um, East Timor and the, um, the hidden connection between the United Nations and East Timor on the, on the uh, uh, day of the election. Um, they um, systematically look at the suppression of information in the European satellite uh, television that broadcast European television, uh, they uh, try to see how the Chinese language um, information is uh, edited and deletes anything back to China from the European news, and then they publish these leaks. Um, of course, they took on the Church of Scientology, they took on the Legionnaires of Christ, one of the most dangerous ultra conservative Catholic. Uh, congregations uh, and publish all the documents of the dealings uh, to prevent the action that the Pope was going to take against them. Um, they uh, leak many of the um, molestation reports uh, in, from the Catholic Church. What I'm trying to say is not specialized in organizing leaks or security reasons from the Afghan war. It's a broad range of everything that is hidden from the view of the citizen, most of which is not a state secret. The huge majority is not a state secret. The diplomatic cables of the gossip vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the leaders in that country or that country um, is simply a window into the actual thinking of this actual global political elite about what the other people are, what the other people do, right? Uh, and uh, certainly the... Um, what uh, we could consider uh, damaging for some governments, like Tunisia, had nothing to do. I mean, revelations through the diplomatic cables about the corruption of the Tunisian president, everybody knew in Tunisia. <laughs> That's why they did what they did, uh, all right? So it's not that WikiLeaks started the Tunisian revolution, by any means, but WikiLeaks exposed to the world what the Tunisian leaders were doing, and from American sources, from American diplomatic sources. Uh, and it's actually interesting because that played a role not in the revolts in Tunisia, but in the uh, international community opinion about what was going on in Tunisia. So in other words, it's informed public opinion, informed public opinion. The interesting thing about uh, WikiLeaks is the extraordinary uh, violent reaction from all quarters corporations, but particularly governments, and particularly from the United States government. There was a contradiction, clearly, between the marvelous Internet speech by Hillary Clinton in January 2010, 
and the way she reacted uh, when her State Department started to be exposed in, in WikiLeaks. And that were the limits of goodwill of uh, political personnel uh, starts being, uh, start being a, a apparent when uh, the real moment of changing the way we do politics uh, appears. The, we know all the reactions against uh, WikiLeaks, but what I want to emphasize is that the, this was not simply, Assange was not simply, Assange is an extremely controversial figure. And many in the hacker community are against Assange because he's, he's God now and he's trying, he, at one point he just went sideways. Uh, but and this is not about the trap he fell in in Stockholm, of course not. Uh, that was a, a, the most traditional trap in the, in the wall of a spies, the most traditional one. Uh, but um, he did many other uh, things. That, but he did have a particular uh, political project, a culture of uh, democracy. Listen to this paragraph. To radically, this is uh, Assange, to radically shift regime behavior, we must think clearly and boldly, for if we have learned anything, it is that regimes do not want to be changed. We must think beyond those who have gone before us and discover technological changes that embolden us with ways to act in which um, our forebears could not. It's a very clear understanding. We have an instrument, we have a global networking capacity, and we have the technology that we can now use to actually force regime change in the sense we have to, we can force openness and transparency where has never been before. One of the uh, comment commentators of uh, Julian Assange, Aaron Beatty, uh, did an analysis uh, calling Assange's philosophy as a philosophy of authoritarian conspiracy. And he, he, said he extracted from some of the uh, Assange writings um, something that is directly relevant to network theory. And, uh, and I, 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 I convey this to our network theory specialist to see if this makes any sense. The notion is, well, <clears throat> when an organization is structured by direct and open lines of communication, will be much more vulnerable to outside penetration. But on the other hand, the more opaque it becomes to itself, as a defense against the outside gaze, the less able it will be to think as a system, to communicate within itself. So you see, the, the, the point is, is about entropy, right? Uh, the, the more you try to protect against the rest of the world, the less transparent you become, the more conspiratorial you become inside, and the less efficient because you have to break down the networks of communication inside. And this trade-off, clearly has been chosen for a long time by all power organizations of being on the side of preserving uh, secrecy rather than efficiency or open communication inside. Um, so what he tried to do deliberately is to <clears throat> address the aggregative process itself by impeding the principle of its, rep of its reproduction. So he wants to attack the total conspiratorial power of the entire system by figuring out how to reduce its total ability to share and exchange information among itself and therefore slow down its processing power. So this is not simply a, 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 a naive operation on the side. This is deep philosophy of autonomy, which is uh, inside. Um, now, of course, WikiLeaks is, is, has been damaged, not destroyed but has been also challenged by uh, other of the people, other people who were in WikiLeaks, like Daniel Domscheit Berg, that quit uh, WikiLeaks to form OpenLeaks, which is based on a different philosophy, uh, which is uh, we, uh, what we do is that um, we will disseminate to third parties everything we know, um, and we will not edit anything. Uh, we will just be a, a way of, uh, of transition, so we receive everything, we disseminate everything, and we actually will not publish to everybody, but to people who are interested, to NGOs, to, to
to social actors, and anyone who wants, we can also disseminate the information. Um, there are WikiLeaks uh, spanning all over the world. There's now, there, there have been WikiLeaks of different kinds. So, kind of WikiLeaks, other leaks, okay? Other leaks organized in China, in Russia, in Europe. There can be counted at least at this point two dozen similar organizations that are expanding. So beyond WikiLeaks, what is clearly happening is a mass insurrection against secret information, even if it is a stupid, meaning gossip, diplomatic gossip, you know, but should not be secret. 99% of what WikiLeaks did, we should have known. So yes, we have free press, but why did we, did we know? It's, it's a problem there, no? So we have great free press, but this free press never reported any of that. So that becomes a problem. And, and what's happening, as in every domain of life, is that citizens uh, using technolo <coughs> technological savvy are invading this sphere of secrecy, creating mechanisms to supersede the information. That is going to be a bloody battle because uh, to understand why the reaction has been so extraordinary um, is because it attacks the heart of the system of power, which is the control of information. And then, of course, there are problems in terms of the, are the state secrets being diffused, are going to be, people are going to be killed because of that. They may, there has been no instances in which this has been proven that anyone has been damaged, but it could happen. It could certainly happen. But the issue is, and there is a debate in the, the community, is how much is value, the, the fact of being in, in total darkness vis-a-vis -vis the protection of a few people here and there. Well, in fact, uh, the, the wall of spies is full of, of people killed in the process on behalf of national security. Weak revolutions. <coughs> I assume you know everything by now, uh, since you are all attentive followers of the <coughs> of the media and the press. So <coughs> let me just concentrate on a few uh, questions. And then if you, again, you want the details, I have details. Um, first of all, there is a process which is repeated, constantly repeated. Um, it starts always with some a moment of outrage. It's an emotional outburst which is provoked by some dramatic event. Uh, like in, in the, remember in the case of, um, uh, started in, in Tunisia, as, as we know, and uh, the, the, the suicide uh, of, uh, uh, remember, Mohamed Bouzizi uh, in, in the Sidi Bouzaid uh, city. Um, he was no revolutionary. He was a street vendor. Was, by the way, he was not a, a college dropout, as the, the media said. He was a street vendor. And he was harassed and harassed and harassed by the police one day, and one day he had enough. It was a matter, and this is important, of dignity. Being humiliated is not a reaction against exploitation. It's a reaction against humiliation. And he was exploited, he was exploited, he was repressed, he was everything, but dignity, personal dignity, was a fundamental thing, and is a fundamental thing in all cultures. Uh, the working class culture in all countries has been based on defending the dignity of the workers. Uh, so, demonstrations, huge demonstrations, and immediately, these demonstrations were immediately organized uh, on Facebook and on the internet, immediately. Um, and, uh, the Tunisian government had a mixed reaction, shut off some sites one day or another, but didn't really, no, the Tunisian government tried just to go and, and smash people. Um, and there, the problem they had uh, was the, the, the mass insurrection at the, at the lower level and the fact that the Tunisian army uh, decided that that was enough and they, they could be in danger, what happened in, in Egypt later on. Uh, and I will explain why uh, this is important, but not as important as people think. So, um, but the key thing was first an, an, an incident that provoked an emotional outburst, and then social networks organized the protest, and no political opposition party, and no unions at the beginning, 
the unions joined in later uh, was uh, were there. And frankly, it's a mechanism that I know so well myself. That was May 68. May 68, a few of us, a few thousand, uh, uh, started like that. No, no organization, no connection. Most of us, whoever has an ideology was anarchism, um, which means no organization by definition, because any organization immediately is power. Um, and the whole country was shaken and everything started to change. Later on, the unions came in. Later on, the left tried to join in, but very much at the end of the process, and of course with, with no success whatsoever, because once you go into the election process, these things change. Of course, it was different. France was a democratic country. It was a process of social change, changing the values. We never tried to occupy the state, to seize power with the state. Who? Oh, <laughs> we were irresponsible, but not that much irresponsible <laughs> to run a country uh, like, like France. No, the, the notion was to change the values, to change people's minds, which is what defines social movements. Political movements try to change power in the state. Social movements try to change values in the minds of the people. And many of the values that later on in France and Europe uh, developed, very much like in Berkeley in the 1960s or in other American campuses, were values created at that time in terms of the women movement, the environmental movement, the human rights movement, the, the international solidarity movement with the third world. So it was a value-producing uh, movement. It started completely spontaneous through different networks, personal networks, which were not uh, the, 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 the Facebook networks now. <laughs> SNS uh, networks had this extraordinary advantage. They are instant, fast, and broad. And, it's every, and everything is transparent. They couldn't do like they were doing in the Trotskyites in, in May 68, having a conspiratory meeting to then try to manipulate the entire movement. Uh, so, or, or, or the communists, or, so no way. I mean, you, you are there, you are open. You know, everybody can check. Uh, and because everybody can check, there is trust. So, in, incident, uh, networks on the internet, but immediately, important, these networks in the internet go from the space of flows, using my terminology, to the space of places. They immediately, they know they're not going to bring down the government, the regime, by the, through the internet, but they are not going to do it by guns either. So they do it by what? By getting together and, and creating a physical pressure that then attracts the media. The media are not going to report on, these guys are saying in Facebook they want to get rid of the regime. Uh, no, they are going to report if there is uh, theatrical, you know, if, if some, there are thousands of people uh, crying, shouting, dancing, organizing themselves, building toilets, uh, making sure that food is there, self-organization, the barricades of history. So ultimately it ends up in the barricades, but the barricades created from the virtual space into the urban space. And this connection between offline online and offline, between the virtual space and the urban space, was absolutely critical. This is the case for Tunisia, the case for Egypt as well. Now, contagion, diffusion, demonstration effect, from Tunisia to Egypt, was no reason why Egypt should explode at the same time than Tunisia. The only reason is that Tunisia exploded. If Tunisia exploded, it is a, huh, how interesting. Uh, let's do it. Um, now, but track in one second. Egypt was in a much more um, confrontational situation than Tunisia. The, 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 Egypt, the wiki revolution in, in Egypt didn't start as a wiki revolution. It started in, on April 6, 2008, in a city north of uh, the working class city north of Cairo, where, um, which is a, a city with uh, 70,000 uh, textile workers working in government-owned textile, textile mills that work for multinational textile corporations, particularly in Asia, in horrible condition. So workers strike. Uh, workers struck in that city, and they demonstrated. They were rejected. The police came in. They beat up the police, and they occupied the city. And then the army came in, uh, the special forces, and they started to kill people, and they suppressed the whole movement. But from there was born one 
little network of people called the April 6th Youth Movement. These were the people who literally started the Facebook demonstrations uh, in uh, January 2011. Uh, so that was there. The embryos were there. And they were the result of class struggles, uh, social struggles against the regime and against exploitation. So all these, the traditional sources of revolution, violent repression, exploitation, uh, humiliation, were there. The difference is that they, when they used the traditional forms of uh, protest and mobilization, they were crushed. When they started the Facebook-led and Twitter-led demonstration, they, they didn't know how to handle that, all right? Uh, so by the time they realized, they, the, the Mubarak, the police, etc., etc., that there was something much more important was happening, people were in uh, Tahrir Square. And, and things started to change. Interestingly enough, in terms of the slogan, the slogan that Tunisia started, people want to bring down the regime, was the same slogan that has been repeated mm -hmm. everywhere, so that, that there is a direct lineage. Uh, second, you know, in all these years that everybody was uh, so scared that Islamists would take over the whole world, etc., there was the, the solution, the, 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 the slogan in Egypt, and in many other places, the slogan in Egypt was, Islam is the solution. This time, very much on purpose, the demonstrators, the first day they started to demonstrate, they, they, they push a new slogan, Tunisia is the solution. <laughs> Mimicking and eliminating Islam, which actually means, hey, we are, we are not Islamists. I mean, we may be Islamic, I mean, we are, we believe in Islam, but we want you know, like these guys, a civil society, a, a democratic government, out of with the tyrants, etc., very explicitly. And they push aside immediately the Muslim Brotherhood, which, by the way, couldn't they have any problem because they were not there in the demonstrations and they, they learned through television about the demonstration. Um, very much like the French Communist Party in, in the 68 movement. Uh, so uh, I, I, I know exactly where, uh, oh, ooh, maybe we can do something there. It looks interesting. Uh, so the critical he thing here is that the connection went from the uh, social networks into the public space. And then this connection became absolutely critical. So when faced with a real movement. Mubarak did as all the others have done later on, and I will only talk about Egypt because uh, it could be endless. Uh, two things. Uh, repressing people, violence, use violence and shutting the minds, right? Shutting communication. This from the beginning of history. Uh, you uh, first hit people and then you shut off communication. So he tried both. Uh, and then, uh, first time in, in history that the internet has been shut off completely. Not completely. That's the interesting thing about, about Egypt. They could not. It's the first time someone tries to uh, close all internet in a country. First time. Even Iran didn't try that. Um, and it didn't work. First, all internet close down, and this I did a technical study on the matter. I can give you details if you are interested. Uh, all the things were 93% of the traffic. 7% was with, uh, because they, they didn't do any plug thing, you know, they didn't push a button and stop the internet. You know that's not possible, right? Uh, <laughs> you also know, by the way, that there is a proposal in the U.S. Congress to invent and design such a button that would shut off entirely the internet in the United States, okay? But for the moment, since the best technologies in the world who are in this room are not collaborating with that, <laughs> there's no way they are going to be able to do it. Um, but uh, they, so they actually, you know, the technical means that they use to shut off the internet is to call the main internet service provider. You know, you are in trouble if you don't shut it off immediately by the codes, You're changing the codes of, of the of the internet traffic and then they changed the codes and then internet traffic was all deviated out of Egypt and could not enter into the networks in Egypt. That simple. But they couldn't do it with everybody because they didn't even know uh, the, the, the mini, mini, mini independent service providers who, who were accounting for about 7% of the traffic. 
but the most interesting thing, that they couldn't do it entirely for five days, remember, five days, because a global movement of support of internet in Egypt started, as it started in Iran, as it started everywhere, and it will continuously start. This is a network of people who don't know each other, who have no organization, but have a common goal. The goal is to defend freedom in the internet, to defend free circulation in the internet. And thousands and thousands of people with good equipment are in this movement. Uh, just to give you a glimpse of what that means, uh, very important thing was the use of the um, Onion router, the Tor network um, that I mentioned before that was used for WikiLeaks was massive in this case and that allowed people to circulate messages from Egypt into the world. But how they could send the message? Well, very simple. Landlines were never cut. You cannot cut landlines in a country because then the police cannot call um, uh, unless very dedicated special commanders. So if you have landlines, you have a smartphone, use as a modem, and then you use the landline. Um, or landlines would call a number in Paris, like one of the French companies that uh, offered that uh, free, and then that number would send a message through a network of Tor or others uh, throughout uh, the world and back to Egypt through different systems. Which systems? Uh, has been highly publicized, the uh, speak to tweet that Google and Twitter uh, um, develop. Is that interesting that Google and Twitter are in revolutions? Uh, <laughs> it's interesting, right? Well, because they are part of a community. They, they, of, of course, they do it to make money. That's their main motivation. But they cannot be completely separate from the culture of freedom in the Internet that the global community has, or they would be in trouble. Um, so uh, how – now, the, the, the thing is clear. The, the tweet would go back to Egypt. Uh, you uh, speak, you call a number, the number trans automatically transfers the message, the voice message into a tweet, and the tweet goes back to Egypt. Little problem. There are only 14,000 users of Twitter uh, in Egypt. Well, first, it's not entirely a problem because we know that you have an entry point. Uh, if you have 14,000, let's say, then reduced to 6,000. Uh, but if you have 6,000 entry points, things start not working, right? But how they would network? Well, there comes another cavalry, uh, Telecomix. Telecomix is a Swedish-based uh, hacker global organization that does all these kind of things, and they design a program uh, that allowed through Google to find automatically all the fax machines numbers in the entire Egypt. <laughs> so all the messages coming in would be sent by fax machine, of course, <laughs> landline, everywhere in Egypt. So Mubarak got a lot of them, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but so did thousands of other people. Once you establish this network of fax machines and the, the, the few tweets and these uh, calls, then other means started to be used, ham radio, and then leaflets, and then graffiti, and then social networks. So the, the whole thing is not only about the Internet. It's the Internet being the core of global local communication, organizing a set of networks that were multiple, multimodal, etc. At the end, after five days, Mubarak uh, decided to uh, stop the blockage of the Internet for uh, various reasons. They were, uh, there has been, OECD has already done a study about how much cost uh, to shut off the Internet under, uh, in a country like Egypt. Well, it's $100 million a day. Uh, so th there was an economic cost for with not great use. The United States, their pressure as an indication of going back to normality. Um, but the main thing is that it was useless. People were already there. So, and therefore, what he tried is the old method, the go and kill them. Uh, and then it was too late because there were too many. And then that created the coverage with Al Jazeera and the other television uh, started to protect to some extent uh, the people who, who is all, also a very important connection in terms of the traditional media playing a, a different role. Mm -hmm. Al Jazeera was very important, but Al Jazeera was being fed by people with their mobile phones, and Al Jazeera st started a program in which uh, all the feed would be sent to all the mobile phone networks free. So it was a, a circuit 
of, of organization. Um, ultimately, the most important thing about revolutions is if uh, two factors. One, overcoming fear that the neuroscientists have discovered that the, the basic emotion that governs our life is fear. This is the basic emotion. Why? Why do we know that? Because those who were fearless were eaten up. If they wouldn't run fast enough, they are not here anymore. This traditional Darwinian logic. Uh, okay, if you overcome fear, everything is possible. The only thing they can do is to kill you. Okay? Uh, but then another, the other mechanism operates. Uh, togetherness, support, networking, protection by the fact that you are not you, but you are you and many and many and many, and this is throughout the planet, and people are organized and mobilized in your defense. Sometimes yes, sometimes not. If people uh, in the rest of the country and in the rest of the world don't care, eh, they will kill you, and that's what happens in many of them. Uh, but if you have a protection system, then the cost of killing escalates, and therefore it's a cost-benefit analysis. How many people I have to kill, and or can I negotiate? And then this is not a unified system. Then the army says, hmm, this is a problem. If I intervene and kill all these people, maybe the army will divide. And all the armies in the world have one principle, never divide. Because as long as you don't divide, you have all the guns. Uh, if, if, you, if you divide, Everybody is in danger, okay? So then the, the analysis is, okay, well, if it is, you know, this guy, 83, is, is, is finished. Uh, and we control the country anyway because we have all, the, all these goodies, all these companies, all these things. Okay, let's get rid of him and then we'll see the situation later. Now, of course, the tough part becomes now in which this revolution is not stopping uh, because has no political intermediaries and they are trying to negotiate directly with the army, et cetera, et cetera. Now, and the, the final point is that, of course, uh, the, the most ridiculous discussion I have seen is uh, the discussion about the revolution cannot be tweeted. Mm -hmm. Of course not. I mean, whoever said that tweets create revolutions? But these revolutions <coughs> would not happen without tweets. Mm -hmm. you, you see the point? It, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition, of course. And this is a typical reaction of New Yorker or Parisian intellectuals, which is the same basically, <laughs> which out of ignorance and out of the fear of being disintermediated by internet networking, react in a way, say, no, no, but it's not the internet. How could it could be the internet? It's a technology. Who, who cares about technology? It's, it's, it's people's struggles. It's, uh, well, yes, it's people's struggles and, and, and all these uh, sources of exploitation and oppression. But guess what? All this was in Egypt two years ago, uh, sorry, uh, three years ago and earlier, and all these struggles were crushed. This one was not. Were different actors, but not only different actors, were people who felt a different kind of togetherness at the moment of outrage, and because they were doing what they were doing in a global uh, communication system, they found the connections with the other networks. So. I can tell you uh, that there is a wind of panic in governments around the world because this disintermediation of professional politics is a danger not only for dictators but for democracies as well. Because if people get the, this bad idea about the starting to organize themselves, uh, all the elites are in trouble. And in that sense, they are playing a very uh, complicated game about accepting the good sides of the wicked revolutions and the bad sides uh, against the bad side, which is losing control. And now why wiki? That's word. Because they are co-generated, co-managed, co-directed like wiki. WikiLeaks is not a wiki, but these revolutions are wiki revolutions as an expression of the capacity of free networking to express in the ground in social political change the culture of autonomy thank you very much
Absolutely, no problem. So at this point, um, it's a little past five, so if people need to leave, that's fine. But if you would like to stay, um, Dr. Cassells would like to field some questions. And we also will have a reception upstairs in the atrium afterwards where people can follow up uh, further. So I'd like to open the floor up for some questions. Question on like um, the, the more on the WikiLeaks question on the on the original site. So, um, I mean, one thing that happens if you have these uh, is really like a a massive increase in the demand and realization of consent. And yeah, if you report exactly. on the public side and on the political side, right. so I'm wondering now, uh, wh how do you see kind of what's the future of privacy in this world? That's a very good point. Um, actually, it was my last sentence that I didn't mention <laughs> because of, of time to read in here. The, the price that you pay for this transparency is to accept forever the end of privacy. Uh, the little twist on that is that has never been real privacy uh, in terms of the ability of the powerful to observe and surveil the powerless. It's always been surveillance, at least for the usual suspects. Um, the difference now is that they surveil, but we can surveil as well. And we have many more eyeballs. Uh, so it's, 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 it's another game. But you are absolutely right. The key is if everything is up front in the net, uh, to the police to start with, and everybody uh, knows exactly what's going on. Now, and the, the issue is how much who actually wins from a transparent society? Uh, my guess, but um, at this point I still have not concluded this analysis by any means, my guess is that the, the least power you have, the more you win in transparency. Because, um, because at, at least it equalizes the, the field, or the, the playing field, uh, between the people who have the technological an organizational means to surveil people and people who have some basic uh, means of surveilling uh, the others. For instance, anyone with a cell phone and, a, and therefore a, a camera and a video can record any uh, wrongdoing by any of the uh, persons, uh, political or corporate personalities that are in the world. So either they live in complete obscurity and clandestinity or their bad behavior is going to be exposed. Ask Senator Allen, for instance, about that. <laughs> uh, so in that game, uh, I think ultimately there is much greater distribution of um, power of control uh, for the people who never have than in the, pre in the previous situation. But yes, uh, as Scott McNeely said, privacy in the internet era, get over it. That, that's a good point. The, you see, first of all, um, people recreate identity. All, all revolutions uh, or social movement, let's say, uh, lead to recreate some form of identity. Uh, people who were together in, in the Tahrir Square, they, they, were, they, they were not Islamists, but they wouldn't say, I'm secular and this and that. No, we are Egyptians. That, that's important. Uh, that so the, they were not saying we are Arabs. We were Egyptian citizens. We are Egyptian. And that was one of the moments in which the nationalist Egyptian identity that had been captured by the military was reclaimed by people saying so and acting as a community beyond ideological or religious divisions. So in that sense, it's interesting because we were thinking that Islam, and I, I have uh, analyzed that because uh, there are kind of instances in which it's shown, Islamic identity was fundamental in the social movements of the Arab world and the Muslim world in general in the last 
10, 15 years, all right? In this case, we have a reversal. Uh, people don't fight as Islamists, don't fight on the defense of Islam, but, but fight as Egyptians, which is exactly the contrary. Islam is based on the Ummah, uh, uh, national identity is based off the nation state and the boundaries of the nation state. So in that sense, I think it's, a, it's an interesting moment of, of reconstruction of identity. And the same thing in Tunisia. So it's the first time we don't hear about being Arab or being uh, Islam. Or it's really about being citizen of my country and therefore reconstructing some form of civil society identity in relationship to the democratization of the state. That's why one of the, if this continues, one of the side effects of these um, wiki revolutions in the Arab countries is to completely undercut Al-Qaeda and radical Islamism. Because as you know, this is the enemy. The enemy of Islam is the nation state. Uh, the civil society based on democracy is the contrary of the civil society based on Muslim identity and even more on pan-Arab uh, identity. So th this is an interesting thing that people have not thought about, that maybe the most important antidote against um, Al-Qaeda is an antidote of building a civil society and a democratic system in the, in the, in the Arab countries. Okay, we yeah. can see that we have a small interesting question, so we would like to uh, move the well, move up come. to the reception. And there people can come and talk. Well, because we just said the opposite. We said that we would stay here until 5.30. Oh, you said 5.30? I'm sorry, I yeah. didn't hear that. Okay, so if people need to leave, <laughs> since we announced this to go until 5 o'clock, um, some people I know need, need to leave, and then at 5.30 we'll go upstairs to the reception. Okay. Well, you actually can choose between wine now or me, so <laughs> it's up to you. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's exactly, to 10 minutes more, if you stand me 10 minutes more, then we all go to wine. Sure, uh, absolutely. It's, it's very different, but it's not least important in many ways. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I don't know you, you you know this thing that even had been on Facebook and and, and other uh, places in the internet. These uh, uh, people in Tahrir Square in Egypt uh, saying Egypt supports Wisconsin, right. uh, <laughs> which is which which is interesting. Which is interesting. Uh, so they are very aware. Uh, uh, but you are, you are certainly right that the, 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 the struggle uh, was organized, um, is organized by unions in the, in the case of the United States, absolutely. Uh, but not only by unions. And there is a very strong movement, not only a student, but uh, society at large. And actually, even the polls say that the majority of Americans support uh, the, the, the Wisconsin protests because they, they see what's coming. Uh, uh, after that. So, uh, but the internet has played a much lower role in that sense, definitely. Uh, although may have played a role, both internet and the media in general, in the um, environment of sympathy that uh, surrounds this, this movement uh, around Wisconsin and uh, around California is also starting at this point. <laughs> but um, when, let's say, the internet, when I said it's a necessary but not sufficient condition, means that um, it's in, in, in certain cases, um, you can have to reach another level of the movement, at the level of the entire society. You would need the internet. But it doesn't mean that if you don't start a movement with the internet, you are going to fail. In that case, societies have their own specific trajectories. Tra traditionally, labor unions uh, start with a different method of struggle, and this is what's happening. Um, I, I, I would say we are at the beginning, not at the end, of the Wisconsin movement, not only Wisconsin. For the Wisconsin movement to be beyond Wisconsin, needs the internet. Uh, and this is already happening, uh, because then you have a much broader public, public opinion. There are Facebook groups being created around this. Uh, students are being now increasingly active uh, uh, throughout the country. And the way in which students network 
it uh, through the internet, but then landing in one public space. So again, it's the connection between networks and uh, public places, and symbolic public places, the capital in that case. Um, <coughs> but listen, for instance, the student movement that started in Berkeley last year against the cuts in the uh, University of California system is not going well at this point because it's isolated uh, from the rest of the society and even from the rest of the students in the country. Um, it will reignite if it is connected through to other struggles which basically are all the same. <coughs> it's the struggles against uh, shrinking the public sector and cutting off benefits and accessibility for people. So th this is the same struggle. Um, and I think uh, the, and the one of the issues uh, to, in terms of the difficulty of extending the struggle is the insufficient use of platforms for debate and discussion uh, in the internet. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. This is a very important point. No, the, all these layers accumulate and, and, and mix and recombine in the culture of the Internet. Absolutely. Uh, I, and in fact, uh, uh, there is a wonderful book by John Markov showing the direct connection between the values of the campuses in the 60s and 70s and the entrepreneurial culture in Silicon Valley, and I would add in, in other places. It's a very direct connection. No, all these cultures are original layers, but then it's like in our brain, the original layers uh, of our uh, neural networks are uh, developed with new layers which add and complexify, and ultimately the internet culture is all of this at the same time with one common uh, trend, autonomy, autonomy and, and freedom. Uh, again, the usage of freedom can be very different, can be making business out of freedom can be a social political revolution but absolutely this is all the what the six layers that I mentioned are mixed into the internet and the more the internet goes and the more we'll have other layers adding like this wiki revolution is are probably creating, creating a seventh layer that will interact with the others Taiwanese to start with, but oh, it's okay. But all of these come from a particular, uh, arguably they all come from a particular no, no. ideology, whereas um, somewhere like Japan doesn't, Facebook, Facebook doesn't work with their conception of their network, or China has its own networking type, it has its own Google. So to what extent would you say that Absolutely. individuation and, and autonomy is a valid agent of the evolution of the network in many senses? Definitely. Uh, look, um, in, in terms of cultures, uh, in the world, uh, what I, there are two simultaneous cultures, not internet, I'm talking about two cultures that we can measure through the World Valley Survey uh, that have emerged with tremendous strength in the last 15 years. One is individuation, the other is communalism. Both equally strong and in fact contradictory to a large extent. Um, but what I, what I really think we can argue is that the internet culture is linked, very deeply linked to individuation, both as a result of individuation culture and as a reinforcement of individuation culture. And that means that it is a global culture, but it's not a universal culture, meaning that uh, in China, the people around the internet communities are as individuated as, as in the United States. And in fact, that's the group uh, that, that connects them. Uh, so, of course, the Chinese woman is not uh, in individuation. That's one of the key contradictions. Um, one of the reasons why all these uh, Arab kids are easily connecting through Facebook or others um, is because already they have gone beyond the traditional communal culture, both of Islam and of the nation state and the, the, the community imposed from the top, and they feel individuals. 
and therefore they connect to each other as individuals and then they develop a collective project. Um, the one thing I, I, I would add to that is that the, the uh, Facebook is not the only, um, the, or not the only one. Facebook in China is not very popular because it's blocked. <laughs> so it's very simple. Uh, China blocks Facebook and Twitter. But there are endless Facebook-like uh, uh, SNSs in China. Uh, so, and, uh, and in that sense, it's a peculiar uh, uh, situation, except that being 20% of the global population, we should pay attention. But it's because there is one government which wants the benefits of the Internet for something, but it's decided that they will not, they will not be overrun by the Internet. Mm -hmm. uh, but even in China, the individuated individuals have started some micro-Chinese Jasmine Revolution. And actually, they have called it Jasmine Revolution. Not working very well. Uh, the one reason is because the capacity to repress in China is so much more intelligent and sophisticated than anywhere else. It's really high technology. They, they are going to start exporting it uh, <laughs> to Europe and the United States very soon. Uh, but the other thing, the best kept secret is the majority of Chinese people are for their government. Uh, uh, like 70% of them. So uh, not the workers fighting their struggles, not the peasants who are being evicted, not the urban dwellers who are being ejected from their neighborhood. There are social struggles, tremendous social struggles in China, thousands of them every year. But this kind of nice democratic revolution of uh, uh, individuals in the internet, etc., this is a very tiny minority, and they are isolated from the population at large. The day they glue, they, there is no way that the, 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 the control of the internet will be as effective as it is today. So I have a question. So we see a no notion that maybe networks could be dual-purpose technology, so dual-purpose technology as a reason to be used for greater evil than networks. And there's heavy debates about the history of technology, about whether or not we should be just developing certain kinds of technology or pursuing certain kinds of research. And so in the context of networks, we've had people like Governor McChrystal have this notion that we should patch or process in this notion that we raised in the 50 weeks and the social sharing could be spliced networks that could be used for both good and evil and to have understanding of processes that generate and retain both terrorist networks or criminal networks but also a potentially criminal process that generate and retain networks that are to be used for good. <coughs> As network scientists, should there be lines of research that we should stay away from in light of you know, the way that these networks could be used for both good purposes? Is there technology that we should or shouldn't develop? Or are there certain institutions and norms that we still need to develop that are going to hold back in light of the fact that networks could be used for good or bad? Well, uh, developing network technology enhances freedom of communication. This is direct as an effect. Um, then is an ethical value. If you think that freedom of communication is a value in itself, regardless of the uses of freedom. You know? Uh, in other words, uh, the ability to be free and to communicate freely doesn't tell you anything, anything about how this freedom is going to be used, right? This, this is a, a different matter. Personally, because that then therefore becomes a personal and ethical question, I think it's very important that people are as free as possible to communicate, uh, that, have, uh, it, that the Internet access is a universal human right at this point, and then for all the other things to two matters we have um, for the bad uses of, of communication, the child pornography. Well, there is child sexual abuse massively in you know, the world. So we have to fight that. And we have to change the values of people and transform the values of society rather than uh, blocking the ability to communicate. That's why I think what network um, uh, scientists and network uh, engineers are doing in terms of finding new technologies to actually be able always to communicate on the internet is a major service uh, to, to humankind. And by that I mean mirrors, I mean proxies, I mean all the things that, that have been developed uh, lately. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of individuals in the world that are devoting their lives, everything they have, to maintain this global network of communication against all dangers. And that I think is a major contribution, personally. Right, there's so one, one, there's one, one last. Actors 
the mistake we've emphasized today, but I have in my map the corporations that you've emphasized that promote uh, that, are <coughs> that are consistent with the kind of autonomy that, that you've described, but rather the corporations, uh, that are, of which I think there are many that are very powerful, that thrive on that autonomy that use it entirely for their own purposes, which are products. Uh, you, you had an example earlier in, in your talk of describing uh, Catalonia about uh, uh, the way that people use the internet to organize to get access to health information. Uh, if you go to the websites of, uh, of the pharmaceutical companies, uh, the, the websites they create for their products, they will organize you into a collective actor uh, mm -hmm. for the, you know, around a particular disease Absolutely. Or for the purpose of a particular product. Right? So this, this creation of, uh, of new collective actors, new collective identities, it seems to me that is increasingly being orchestrated. No, absolutely. Uh, in, in other words, no, certainly I did not emphasize the role of corporations because clearly these movements I have studied uh, recently are on the state. Uh, although in my book, Communication Power, is a long analysis of the corporations and, and how they operate in the Internet world. Uh, but you see, Internet is the decisive technology of our time because it affects communication. Mm -hmm. So everybody and everything is in the Internet and everybody acts on and by the Internet. Everybody. And those who don't simply get pushed aside by competition and by uh, conflict uh, with people who are much better equipped. So in, in that sense, of course, corporations use the Internet in many different ways. But I happen to have studied the health system and interaction between the, 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 the pharmaceutical webs and, and, uh, and people looking for information. And uh, it's very interesting. Uh, you have two... Two, uh, two, really two systems. Doctors hate that patients use the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, pharmaceutical companies love that patients use the internet. <laughs> okay, uh, so one wants to disintermediate the information; the other don't want to be disintermediated because, hey, if, if people start finding information by themselves, it's a problem. They, no one is going to prescribe it he, herself or himself in terms of the what they find on the web. But they are going to come. Uh, to the doctor armed with this list of questions, they have like three minutes, you know. Um, so, uh, but, uh, so, but they are, so pharmaceutical companies are doing what you are uh, saying, but what I have observed there, um, many, many groups being formed among health uh, users, patients, families, etc., to do two things. First, to organize groups of support. Actually, one of my students is finishing the dissertation exactly on that. The communities that are formed around hospitals to organize groups of support. Second, uh, critical groups that, you know, check the information on the website and post denunciations in alternative websites about what these guys are doing. So it's, it's an open field. Uh, pharmaceuticals try that. Other people try something else. And who wins depends on situations. You see the point? Thank you.